Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining today's webinar. My name is Cheryl Jennison DeProza, and I'm joined by Sure corporate historian Michael Pedersen. And today, Michael is going to be talking us through the history of the Sure Unidine series of mics. Lots of great historical microphone information to get into. Um, but before we get into that, just a few items of housekeeping. And while I'm doing the housekeeping, I'm going to go ahead and launch a little poll um, so that maybe we can get an idea of, of what everybody's knowledge of Sure microphone history is. So let's launch this poll right now now. Um, okay, so of this poll, of these four U.S. presidents, who did not use a sure mic while in office? Um, take a few minutes, think about that, see if you know the right answer, and while you're doing that, I'm going to go through some of the housekeeping. So first of all, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing. Usually takes us a couple of business days to get it edited and up, but once it is available, it will be on sure.com slash webinars. That is sure.com slash webinars. And that is a great place to go to see all of our past archived webinars, but also to see all of our upcoming webinar, webinar information. So sure.com slash webinars, bookmark it, visit it often, um, lots of great information there. Second of all, as we go through the session today, if you have any questions, please feel free to type those in the Q&A section. Um, I believe if you are logged in through the web app, um, you should just look for a question mark maybe in a circle. Um, or if you are actually using the GoToWebinar control panel, um, look for a dark gray toolbar with an orange box with a white arrow in it. Click on that orange box and you will be able to access the Q&A section. Ask any questions that you may have, but please note that we will be holding on those until the end of the session. So type them in and um, Michael will answer as many of those as we can get to at the end. All right, I think that just about wraps up all the housekeeping and we've got over 70% of the votes. So I'm gonna close out this poll. Give me just one second here. And I'm gonna share the results. So it looks like most people think that Herbert Hoover was the only president who did not use a sure mic in office. Um, Michael, can you tell us what the actual answer is? Herbert Hoover is correct, because Herbert Hoover was out of office before Sure branded and sold their first microphone. So Herbert Hoover is indeed the correct answer. Well, it sounds like we've got some knowledgeable people here today on the on the session. I'm, I'm in trouble then, if that's the case. <laughs> All right. Well, as I mentioned, this is Michael Pedersen. He is our Sure corporate historian. He keeps track of all sorts of interesting Sure bits of knowledge and arcana. Um, he collects products that he finds out in the wilds um, and has a pretty cool job. So we're really lucky for him to join us today. Um, so, Michael, tell us a little bit about uh, the history of Sure Unidine microphones. Yeah, and we're going to talk about the green bullet at the end as well. So let's talk about what's inside of a Unidine, first of all. Uh, people, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with microphones, and there are some interns on this call, a microphone basically has two parts. There's the internal part, the transducer, which sometimes we refer, refer to as the motor. That's the actual element or device that turns acoustical energy into electrical energy. And then there's the outside, the housing. So there's two different things. The housing is, you know, is different from the motor. So the unidine itself is referring to the internal motor. 1939, we brought out the Unidyne 1. 51, we brought out the Unidyne 2. And in 1959, we brought out the Unidyne 3. And we're going to explore all those as we go through. But first of all, let's go back and look at the very first Unidyne 1. This is called the Model 55, introduced in 1939. Probably, arguably the most important microphone that we ever brought out. And it was the world's first unidirectional, meaning it listened more in one direction than other directions, moving coil dynamic microphone done with a single capsule. That was a big breakthrough. You could do directional microphones with two capsules, but this was the first one we could do with, with a single capsule or a single motor. Let's use that same term. So let's go on from here. Who invented it? It was called the Uniphase Network. This is the acoustical network inside that made this microphone possible. And he invented this when he was only 24 years old. And the guy that invented this is going to be in the next slide. Here he is. Benjamin B. Bauer. I love this photo, by the way. He, so he was the inventor of the Uniphase Acoustical Network, born 1913 in Odessa, Ukraine. And here he is in 1937, so he's 24 years old. He comes to work for sure directly out of college, and his first invention and his first patent is a microphone that changed the world at age 24. Man, I wish I was that smart. November 19th, 1937, this is from Bauer's lab notebook. By the way, these lab notebooks are sitting about five feet away from me, locked up in a cabinet. And here's his first description of what's called the Uniphase Acoustical Network Concept. This single page 
changed microphone design forever. And I love this quote, the following arrangement seems to offer possibilities. Yes, Ben, it really does. It just changed the entire world. Look at this little diagram right here. You don't need to memorize it. We're gonna see it much later on, brought back time and time again. So let's go on from here. Here's what Ben's first operational Unidyne prototype looked like. Doesn't look like much like a microphone. Doesn't even look like much like a microphone motor, does it? But this actually operated and he powered it up because it required a magnetic field by sticking a horseshoe magnet to the bottom of it. We have this uh, prototype in the Sure archives as well as all the other prototypes that Ben made leading up to the 1939 introduction of the Model 55. So we went from industrial design prototype in 1938, and this is what it's going to look like. This is a wooden model that we have in the archive that's painted uh, silver. So that was the original look, way, look, way it was gonna look. And we went to the final version in 1939. So it went, was basically a two year uh, process. In 2014, IEEE, that's the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, it's a worldwide organization, awarded sure a milestone for the invention of the Unidyne microphone. Let me show you that milestone award. Here it is, uh, dated January 31st, 2014, it's milestone number 137. And IEEE recognizes inventions and peoples and projects that have had a worldwide impact on computing and electrical engineering. Just to give you an idea, other milestone awards have been given for the work of Nikola Tesla, the creation of the internet, breaking of the Enigma code during World War II for the Apollo level moon landing and for the Sure Unidyne microphone. So we're in really fine company. What was the inspiration for the appearance of the Unidyne? So the motor's inside, but most people know the Unidyne from what it looks like. Well, I think you'd be very interested to see this next slide. Here's the inspiration of the Unidyne, a 1937 Oldsmobile Coupe 6. It has exactly the same number of horizontal ribs, one vertical rib right towards the middle of it. And interestingly enough, Mr. Schur owned Oldsmobile cars. So we don't know if he walked out in the parking lot one day and looked at it and said, hey, that might make a, make a look cool looking microphone. But there you go, that's the inspiration of it. And who created the Unidyne industrial design? Who created the housing? This is something I only discovered within the last couple of years. And we're gonna show you him on the next slide. Seated down in the front, there is Wesley Scherer. Now, Wesley did not work for sure. He was an outside contractor and he did graphic and product designs for us. By the way, here's Ben Bauer over here in 1938. I love the spit curl. Uh, Wesley worked for us for on various projects, but eventually he left working for sure and being an independent contractor and went to work for Play School Toys. And for the rest of his career, he designed toys for kids. I think that's a kind of interesting aspect of the Unidyne. 1939, March, we introduced it, the Unidyne to our customers. Um, at the same time, by the way, we introduced our first ribbon microphone, which is called the Rocket Model 50. I love that name. The Unidyne was priced for $45. If we put that into 2022 currency, it would be $850. So it was not a cheap microphone by any means. Here's another Bauer document. This is from 19, June 1939. Uh, ben Bauer documents the product production version of it. So this is a drawing of what the actual unit looks like or the actual motor inside of it looks like. And just to show you that, that here is the copy of the page I've got right here from my, in my office. So let's go on to the next page. We're gonna show you the patent that came from this. April, 1941, we are issued a patent for the Unidyne uh, conversion of wave motion into electrical energy. It doesn't say microphone, it says conversion. The wave motion meaning air and turning into electrical energy. So here is the actual patent drawing, and here is that page that I showed you just before. So you can see that that drawing there was put onto the patent. Interestingly enough, you notice the name doesn't say Bauer, it says Baumsweiger. He was born Benjamin Baumsweiger. He changed his name in 1941 to Bauer because Schur started to do a lot of work for the government uh, during World War II, and this is right before World War II started, but we were still doing work. And every time the military people would come to Schur to visit, they would say Baumsweiger. And that name German? So he got tired of that, and he shortened it to Bauer. Next one, please. We have a little saying. It says, since 1925, Schur products have delivered the sounds of history and culture to the world. I could do an entire presentation just showing interesting photographs. But here's a photograph from 1945. 
This is when the U.S. and Japan signed a peace treaty on the USS Missouri. Um, this is General MacArthur signing it, and here is a Unidyne there. Most of you don't know this, but many, many, many of the famous historical and musical events from the 20th century and now the 21st century have been heard through Shure microphones, and this is one example. So Elvis Presley in the Unidyne one. We'll talk a little bit more about Elvis later. He was photographed so often <clears throat> with that microphone that people sometimes refer to it as the Elvis microphone. There he is with the larger Unidyne one. But 12 years later, now it's 1959, after, uh, after uh, excuse me, 1951, the Unidyne suddenly became smaller. And in 51, we introduced the Unidyne 2. That's the model 55S. What does S stand for? It stands for small. Isn't that original? 66% the size of the Unidyne 1. And the reason we made a smaller version of it was there was something called television. And television said, we really like that Unidyne 1. It's too big. Make it smaller because it's covering up too much of the face of the person when they're on television. And that's why we came out with the Unidyne 55S. Here's a print ad from 1952. This is an interesting ad, the microphone that needs no name. If you look at that ad really closely, you'll see that the name Sure doesn't appear anywhere in it. Our logo does, but the name Sure doesn't come up there. And the reason was it was so popular for live sound in the 40s and the 50s that everybody knew that microphone, even if they know they didn't need to know the name. So that was just so, so iconic that we came up with this ad, the microphone that needs no name, photographed more celebrities the world around the world than any other mic. Chuck Berry, Unidyne 2. Many of the rock and roll pioneers preferred the Unidyne 2. If you go back and look at photos of uni rock and roll players in the 50s, you will see most of them in front of Unidyne 2. Next slide, please. You'll even see this guy, Frank Sinatra in the Unidyne 2. He first sang into a Unidyne 1 in the 1940s when he was with Tommy Dorsey. I got a story about Frank Sinatra later I'm going to share with you. And people love their Unidynes. If you just do a Google search, just do microphone tattoo. You don't have to put in sure, you don't have to put in Unidyne, just do microphone tattoo. You'll find pages and pages and pages of people with the Unidyne tattooed on some part of their body. One guy at an audio engineering show came up to me and he showed me the image on his right arm. He showed me the polar pattern on his left arm. And then he unbuttoned his shirt and showed me the frequency response on his chest. Wow. I have nothing else to say. So. 1939, Unidyne 1, 1951, Unidyne 2, 1959, Unidyne 3, and that was the model 545. We advertised that as the world's smallest cardioid dynamic microphone. It was $50 at the time, and for those who are microphone geeks, notice no XLR connector. It has on it what's called an Amphenol connector. We know that Bauer invented the Unidyne 1, we know that Bauer invented the Unidyne 2, but who invented the Unidyne 3? Because Ben Bauer left Shure in 1957. Well, it's this gentleman here, his name Ernie Seeler. He was born in Cuba. Uh, his mother was, uh, father was German, mother was American. He joined Shure in 53, retired in 97, and interestingly enough, he trained under Ben Bauer, who also lived in Cuba as a youth. We don't know what, the, what was in the water down there, but obviously it created great microphone engineers. Unidyne 3 was our first end addressed unidirectional microphone. In other words, you sang into the end of it, rather into the side of it. That doesn't seem like a big deal, but if you know a lot about microphone design, you'll know that an end fire microphone gives you a much more improved polar pattern, and that improves, improves game before feedback, how loud you can turn it up before it squeals, and therefore it made PA systems louder, and of course, rock and roll was getting bigger and louder in larger concerts. So the Unidyne 3 was the microphone, the right place at the right time. Interestingly enough, Ernie despised rock music. He really wanted to make classical microphones, but hey, Ernie, he made the best rock and roll microphone in the world. There's a presence peak on the Unidyne 3. Again, for those of you that are new to microphones, this is a rising response in the high end. It adds a brightness to the sound of the speech. And Ernie wanted that Unidyne 3 to be flat. He didn't like that presence peak. He thought it was a flaw in his design. But interestingly enough, it's that presence peak that makes the microphone so popular. So if it hadn't been there, probably wouldn't be as popular as it has been for the last 60 years. The other person involved in this was Bob Carr. So this is 1963 and 1964. Bob worked here as a product manager. In fact, when I started working at uh, Sure, Bob was one of my mentors. And he came up with the idea of coming out with a studio line of microphones. 
Sure SM microphones. SM stands for studio microphone. Not sure microphone, but studio microphone. And it was based on an existing line of mics that we already had, like the Unidyne 3, but he put new features on it. He put a non-reflective dark finish on it. He put an XLR connector on it rather than an amp and all. You're all wired for balance, low impedance, and there was no on-off switch, or if there was an on-off switch, it could be hidden by a plate. So in late 64, the first SM line came out, and it consisted of five models, the SM5, 33, 50, 56, and SM76, and that was the first of the Shure SM line. 1964, the Unidyne 3 SM56 arrives. So here's the first SM microphone that had a Unidyne 3 motor in it. It was simply a variation of a microphone we already had below 546. <clears throat> it was $81. Uh, it had a non-reflective gray finish, an XLR connector, front plate, we already talked about that, and this switch on the front. There was a switch hidden here, and that switch, if you used it, could give you high impedance off or low impedance. But if you didn't want it, you just simply covered up that plate with a switch. August 65, the Beatles were early users of our Unidyne 3. They weren't using the SM mics yet. They were using the Model 545. Here they are performing in Chicago at Comiskey Park Baseball Field. Um, these microphones were on loan from Shure. We had loan Beatles management, 12 545s and the accessories for this tour. The deal was when the tour was over that these microphones were going to be sent back to Shure and then we were going to auction them off for charity. So the tour ends, a week goes by, no mics, four weeks go by, no mics, eight weeks go by, no mics. Finally, someone from our PR department contacts Beatle Management and says, so where are those microphones you were supposed to send us back? And they said, oh, we sent them back the day after the tour ended. We sent them back to your service department. Did you put any documentation inside that they were from the Beatles or so forth? No, we just sent them back, put them in a box and sent them back. We traced it back. Service department got these 12 mics, didn't know where they had come from, didn't know who to send them back, and so they all got scrapped. Oh, man, don't I wish I had those in the archives now. 1965, the SM57 is introduced. Looks very much like an SM56. It's a variation of a 545. It was $63 at the time, $63 uh, when it was introduced. And... 1966, the White House Communications Agency, which is abbreviated as WACA, first deployed the SM57 for President Johnson. It has been the president's microphone since then. Every president since Johnson through Biden has used the SM57. Sometimes it's four, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's one, it's varied, but it's always the SM57. As a matter of fact, in the 56 years, there's never been a failure of a mic. They've had cable failures, but not one mic has failed. And over that time period, there's been over four, I think they own over 400 of them now. In fact, I just pulled something here just to kind of show you. Here are two SM57s and the stand, uh, line that up, that was used by Jimmy Carter, Reagan, and Bush number one. Uh, by the way, the other thing I like to say about the 57 is that more lies have been heard through SM57 microphones than any other microphone in history. <laughs> I'm with police. Here's a mic you probably know, the SM58. That hits the market in September 1966, a year after the SM57. It is simply an SM57 with a ball grill. No matter what you read on the internet, nobody, what you tell me, it's a Unidyne 3 motor inside there with a ball grill. It was $81. The first year sales were very disappointing. We sold 145 SM58s for the entire year. In fact, we didn't even crack a thousand sales per year until 1971. Also that same year, the Unidyne, the Unisphere One. Why did they change it from Unidyne 3 to Unisphere One? Simply a marketing thing. So a Model 565, which is called a Unisphere One, is simply a Model 545 with a grill. It is a Unidyne 3 motor inside. We don't use the term Unisphere anymore. It was just a marketing thing. But it is a Unisphere no matter what. It had an Amphenol connector rather than an XLR, and it was $70. We're going to talk about that microphone a little bit later on. June 1967, the Monterey Pop Festival in California. This was a big breakthrough. This is really pretty much considered the world's first really large pop festival with rock and roll featured. It was outdoors. All the microphones were SM56s, front line and back line. Uh, a company called McCune Sound supplied all the PA system. The guy named Abe Jacobs specified the gear. 
they liked the 56 because it was loud. It could be used for loud PA, looked great. And that's so that's always used by Hendrix. You can see Jimi Hendrix here, Joplin, The Who, Jefferson Airplane, everybody that performed there was used the SM56. We are fortunate on the next slide to see that one of those SM56s, which was used on stage at Monterey Pop and other Californias, is now owned by the archive. Uh, this is a photo of a SM56 in our archive with a Harry McCune label on it. It's actually engraved McCune number 43. Uh, he had bought 50 SM56s, and all these they number and they were engraved one through 50, and they were used for all those festivals uh, in the 50, late 60s, including this one with Jimi Hendrix. Uh, we know this was used with Hendrix. We don't know if it was his vocal microphone. We don't know if it was a backline microphone or a drum microphone. But no matter when, it was on stage. And you can see there's that red label there, and there's that red label there that says Harry McCune Sound. Uh, by the way, people say, where did I get that? I bought it on eBay. Next, please. 1969, before Woodstock happened, there was called the Summer of Soul Concerts, and this was in New York City. This is the first major festival, I believe, where all the microphones were for the front line were SM57s, not SM56s. Here's Stevie Wonder with an A2WS windscreen and the SM57. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, this movie or documentary won an Academy Award this year called The Summer of Soul. Check it out. Every performer uh, on the front line is using an SM57 with an A2WS windscreen. A month later, August 1969, was the Woodstock Music Festival. All the microphones there were model 565, Unisphere 1, or Unidyne 3s. It was the only model used on stage at Woodstock. The people that worked, worked at Woodstock were all volunteers. And the sound company that put together the PA for Woodstock basically put, there's about 20 microphones on stage. They were all the same. They're all 565s. And they would just tell the volunteers, put a mic in front of this guy, put a mic in front of the amplifier, put a mic in front of the drums. They didn't have to tell them what mic. They just grabbed the mic and put it up there. All of them were 565s. All of them had a little adapter on it, which I don't think you can see very well now, but they changed the Amphenol connector to a female XLR connector. This was made by Switchcraft. It was just a little adapter at the end because they liked the XLRs. You could change them out quicker. All the mics in Woodstock, 565s. So we bring out the SM58 in 1966. It's not selling very well because we're trying to push it to radio and TV people. Um, here's an ad that we brought out. And it's all about broadcasting. It's all about using it for broadcasting and news and so forth. And that's really wasn't the market for it. We just were, didn't know where to sell it. Believe it or not, in the late 1960s, the SM56, the 57, and the 58 were all being considered for discontinuation because of poor sales. They've been out for five, six, seven years. They weren't doing what they wanted to. Fortunately, our Roger Ponto, guy who hired me at Sure, and also our national sales manager said, well, maybe let's take this up to Las Vegas. There's a lot of live sound going in Las Vegas. Maybe this will make a good microphone for live sound. And Roger was indeed correct. Later in 1970, we introduced the 545 SD and the 565 SD. By the way, these are still current models. The Amphenol connector got replaced by the XLR. Excuse me, that's a very good, Cheryl. The lockable on-off switch was added, and an S stood for switch on-off, and D for dual impedance. These are current models. Also, in 1973, we introduced the SM7. If you've seen a podcast of anything in the last five or six years, you've seen the SM7. It is a Unidyne 3 variation. Uh, and now, next year, it's going to be 50 years old, and it is one of the most popular microphones in the Shure line. We introduced the 7A in 1999. We introduced the 7B in 2001. This here is a picture of the SM7B. <clears throat> 1975, Queen releases the song Bohemian Rhapsody. And once that happened, Freddie Mercury is forever linked to the model 565 SD. I haven't been trying to track down what made them to lose, the, why, why he liked the 565 SD. Um, the closest I found out is that it was one of the first mics he used as a pro, and he just decided to stick with it, saw, saw it as a lucky charm, if you will. If you go to Montreux, Switzerland, there is a Queen Museum. I was fortunate enough to be there in 2019. I took these photos. Here's a 565 that Freddie used on stage at the Queen Museum, and here's the actual text there. Freddie Sure Unisphere vocal microphone often used in concert. 
and it was a live, and there it is, typed up just like you expect it to be. For one specific tour, and I've not been able to track it down which one yet, Sure supplied Queen with the quantity of mics that were engraved with the term Freddie Mercury. At the end of each concert during this tour, he would throw the mic into the audience as a souvenir. And this one here was caught by a guy who lived in South Carolina. Uh, this is many years later, and he wanted to know if it was authentic. And so I offered to, if you'd send it back to us to take a look at it, we could make, you know, find out if it was authentic or not. How did I do that? I looked at this engraving. We have other microphones in our archive, which were engraved for other artists, not Freddie Mercury. Under a microscope, that engraving was exactly the same as the microphones we have in the archives. And therefore, it was a genuine Freddie Mercury microphone. I really tried to get him to return it to the archives, but he wouldn't do it. So, oh well. Yes, Cheryl. And Michael, just a fun side note, I remember um, when that microphone came in, I was working at customer service because I think maybe you brought it down to us and I, I should did. have sent it to you. I have a picture of me from my first year ah. at Sure holding the Freddie Mercury microphone with a face like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish we could have got it for the archive, but you know, he, yeah, we understand why you wanted it back. All right. Thanks. Next slide. So we mentioned Frank Sinatra before. 1977, Sure brought out a microphone called the SM59. You've probably never heard of the SM59 for many good reasons, but here it is in the lower left-hand corner. Sinatra was a 58 fan. He used it before wireless microphones became popular. Wired 58 was pretty much his go-to mic. So it's 1977. We just brought out the SM59. Roger Ponto, guy I mentioned before, and I go to Las Vegas. Roger gives me a task. Go over to Caesar's Palace. Frank Sinatra is rehearsing this afternoon and get him to try the SM59. The sound engineer will help you. Okay, boss, I'm, I'm new at sure. I don't know much about this. So I go over to Caesar's Palace and I talk to Dave Rogers. He's the sound engineer at uh, Caesar's Palace and a, a fan of sure. I show him the microphone, he goes, oh yeah, I'll take it down on the stage. I'm sure Frank will <clears throat> be happy to try it out. So I stay in the sound booth, I'm about a hundred feet away. Dave trots down to the stage and swaps out the SM59 for the SM58, but doesn't tell Sinatra. Ooh, mistake. So Sinatra comes out for the rehearsal, says hello to the band, and he looks for his microphone, and his SM58 is not there. And he says kind of loud to anybody, where is my friendly SM58? Now, he used an F word, but it wasn't friendly. And uh, someone on stage said, oh, that's a new mic from Sure, Frank. They want you to try it out. Would you try it out? So he's not happy, but he says, eh, okay. So he counts off <clears throat> the first tune, and he sings about eh, maybe eight bars, and he takes the SM59 out of the stand and throws it with all his might across the stage. Boom, 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 bounces along, hits the right-hand stall, page, and he yells, get me my 58. And one of the audio techs on stage goes over and plugs the 59, Plugs in the 58, <clears throat> puts it back up on the stand. Rehearsal goes on. Sinatra's happy. Now, I'm watching all this from about 100 feet away, and I'm white as a sheet, I'm certain. And I'm like, what am I going to do? Well, this goes on for a while, and the, the guy on stage, the audio tech, slowly walks up to the sound booth, comes up to me, gently hands me the SM59, and he says, Mr. Sinatra didn't like it. And I took that microphone and ran as fast as I could. So that's how I lived the tour. And I said, listen, I think, tell that kid from sure not to come back. He didn't say that, but that's how I felt. <laughs> 1989, we introduced the Unidyne 2. <clears throat> Remember now, in 1951, we introduced the Unidyne 2, but now we introduced a new model, the 55SH Series 2. It has an updated element in it, and it also has an XLR connector in it as well. So we're still making this uh, here in 1989. Rock and roll abuse, Roger Daltrey. Roger Daltrey has used the SM58 since the 1960s. You may know him as the singer of The Who, but one of the things he loves to do is swing the cable around, see the microphone around and around the cable. Well, we've got this wonderful video that Cheryl managed to track down and she's gonna play it now. It's about two minutes and this is Roger Daltrey explaining about why he likes the SM58 and why he swings the cable. So let's see if that video can run, Cheryl. I've found this microphone to be absolutely remarkable and no one's more abusive to a microphone than I am uh, not only with the bad vocals but <laughs> and the bum notes but 
you know, generally misuse of a mic completely. Like, I remember I did a, a thing for sure, and uh, to demonstrate how good this mic was, I slammed it at the floor deliberately. Bang, like that. And then picked it up and did the rest of the interview with the crowd with the microphone. It didn't break it, didn't change the sound of it. It was extraordinary. Well, the, uh, the, the swinging of the microphone, um, I, I can't really remember when it started. I think it kind of started in 1967, out of boredom. During, we, we used to do very long, kind of guitarists have lots of things to play with when the band goes into a jam. And I used to just get totally bored. And uh, so I just used to play with it. And I thought, well, this is interesting. And it, I could do more and more things with it. And in those days when I had my eyesight, I could, I ended up, I could take a cigarette out of someone's mouth from about 20 feet away. <laughs> I got that, that good with it. Very kindly, sure, I, I said to Shaw, do you mind if um, we keep the microphones after every show and I donate them to charities? Because singers have very little they can give to auctions and things where people are trying to raise money for, for foundations. And kindly Shaw said, yep, you can have every one. And uh, since then, they're now fetching really good money for lots of good causes all around the world. So that's, that's really brilliant. And I thank them for that. Thanks, Cheryl. That's, I, I love that. And by the way, the, the cigarette was in the mouth of Peter Townsend. He didn't say that, but he would, he would do that to just say, okay, you've been jamming long enough. Let's get on with it. 2008, this is from the Shure Archive, Mr., uh, Mrs. Shure, uh, the wife of Mr. Shure and the owner of the company at the time, Mrs. Shure, penned a letter to Roger Daltrey of The Who. Uh, they were going out on a concert tour. And she just said about the image of swinging your microphone by its cable into the air is engraved in the history of rock. I just love it. She got a lovely letter back from Mr. Dolphy. So he was thrilled that she took the time to write him. Next, please. 2009, also, <clears throat> we introduced our Super 55. We still make this model today. It is a super cardioid. The on-off switch is eliminated. And the blue foam inside there recalls the blue cloth that was used on the very first Unidyne 1. Model 55S in 1951. That's why it's blue, is because the cloth in the original one here. This is foam here, but it's cloth there. But that's why we chose to put blue in the Super 55. 2017, uh, we expanded upon what Roger was talking about. We came out with microphones that were labeled or basically had dyed, painted. They were painted, or they had, I guess, I don't know, they were like, I think it was a vinyl uh, enclosure. But anyways, they were for marked for the Who and one for Paul McCartney. Um, the, the, were all the proceeds of selling those went to charities. Uh, the who was teen cancer America. McCartney was a meet three Mondays. There were 300 of them. They were sent out to auction and the serial numbers one through 10 were actually signed by the artists in gold or silver ink. I've seen some of those on eBay and those things are going for signed ones for several thousand dollars. Um, uh, pretty cool. It was nice, a nice project to be involved in. And then 2022, just this year, <clears throat> Rolling Stones uh, were honored by the United Kingdom with a whole series of stamps. This is one stamp that they've got out there. Notice the SM58 is on there in front of Mr. Jagger. And it was 50 years ago to the year that this mixed mic poster was first issued in 1972. So here's a 72 poster of Mick and Keith with an SM58. And here's a 2022 stamp with them with an SM58 and Ronnie Wood over here as well. So that's kind of a cool thing. Change gear. We're going to talk about the Green Bullet. That's not a Unidyne, but it's a classic Shure microphone, and we'll give you a little history on that. So the first bullet mics, and they call called a bullet mic because they're shaped like a bullet, uh, hit the market in 1939. They were the Model 7A and the Model 5G. We called them the Streamliners. The 7A had a crystal element in it. The 5G had a ribbon microphone in it, but they had that bullet shape that was going to become famous, and we still make bullet microphones today. Next, please. 1946, we replaced the 7A with a 707A. Pretty much the same microphone, different color, um, but basically there's still that same shape of the bullet microphone. 47, we introduced our first dynamic microphone. It's a moving coil element. The other ones were, again, there was a ribbon, there was a crystal. Here's our first moving coil uh, bullet microphone. It's called the Oconodyne. Not a great name, but there you go. It had it. 
high impedance and an iridescent gray color on them. Here's the Econodyne. And then in 1949, that's where the famous green bullet came out. So here's the green bullet microphone. That's kind of a generic term for it. It was painted this kind of army green. <clears throat> uh, it was high impedance, omnidirectional. It had what's called a controlled reluctance element in it, which is a variation of a moving coil. I won't get into that unless we have a time at the end here with questions to tell you how re controlled reluctance works. But this is the microphone that we brought out. And we've aimed it at two-way radio dispatching um public address as far as making announcement the last thing we ever thought would have would be for music 1950s it was used for paging and two-way radio selected for military use of the durability if you're familiar with the tv series mash which was set in the korean war next time you see radar o'reilly making an announcement to the to the uh camp he is using a green bullet microphone from 1949 and here is a photo from the tv series with the green bullet on a stand now, unbeknownst to us, in the 1960s and the late 50s, Chicago Blues Harmonica, or I also call Harmonica Harp, I don't know why it's called Harp, by the way, players popularized the Green Bullet for live sound. It fit really, really well into your hands, the cupped hands. It was high impedance, so you could plug it into your guitar amp. It was far less expensive than the Unidyne 3, which had come out in 1959. And when you really blew into it, it distorted. And the people and the harp players love this distorted. So again, unbeknownst to sure, the green bullet now is being used for something we didn't even predict. It's being used for blues harp. So in the late 1970s, I'm working at Sure, and Sure decides to announce that the green bullet is going to be discontinued. Not because, because of poor sales to two-way radio and paging. We were talking to our two-way radio dealers or paging people. Nobody's buying that green bullet anymore. Get rid of it. So we make this announcement. And all of a sudden, remember, this is pre-internet, pre-email. We started to get letters and letters and letters from blues harp players saying, you guys are idiots. This is the best blues harp, blues harmonica microphone ever made. And sure is like, what? People are using this for music? We didn't know that. Now, the reason I know this has occurred is that I was given the task of discontinuing the green, green bullet and all the complaint letters I had to answer. And so pretty much after a while, I eventually went to Sure Management and said, we might want to think twice about this. We're just trying to sell it to the wrong people. So in the early 1980s, we announced that the green bullet will remain active. We're not going to discontinue it. We're going to make a new version of it called the 520D, D for low, low, uh, dual impedance, higher low impedance, and repackage it for music stores. And so here it is now, let's see, <clears throat> what is 1949? So here it is, what, 36 years later, and we finally have figured out that this microphone is a great blues harp mic. Wow, sometimes it's a little slow to figure these things out, but we got it eventually. And in 1998, we brought out the 520DX. We added a volume control on the back. It's still dual impedance. Now it's a moving coil element rather than a controlled reluctance or controlled magnetic, and it's got a volume control on it. And here it is, 2022. Uh, eight decades since we introduced it, and it's still the famous, the most favorite blues harp player around the world. It's just, it just works for that type of sound. Next, please. Uh, I'll take just a second on this. If you want to learn more about blues harp microphones, there's a bunch of uh, websites to check out. The ones I like best are the greenbulletmics.net. But if you don't remember that, just put in the search, search of the internet, blues harp microphone blue sharp microphone and you come up with all kinds of websites which talk about what microphones are used and far more detail than even I know about the, the green bullet and how it's used. <clears throat> so back to the Unidyne for something completely the same. Let's do uh, answer some frequently asked Unidyne questions and we'll get to your questions. What does Unidyne mean? Well, it's a sure trademark that was granted in 1960. And it has various meanings. Uni means a single mic element. Remember, the Unidyne microphone was a single element, a single motor inside there. And it means a unidirectional pattern. And dyne is short for a dynamic mic element, meaning it has a magnet and is also a unit of force used in acoustics. So we combine them together and we get the name Unidyne. Okay. What does SM58 mean in SM58? What does 58 mean in SM58? Nothing. It's not nothing but a mus numerical sequence. So, in, so we had a model 55, and then a 55S, and then an SM56, and then an SM57, and then 58 was next. Then we had a 59, which we talked about, and we had a 60, and we had a 61, and we had a 62, and we had a 63. 
you get the idea. So it just happened to be that 58 was the next in sequence and became famous. Uh, by the way, SM58 itself, that trademark is, or that model number is a registered trademark of Sure. Differences between the SM57 and SM58. As I said, the motors are both Unidyne threes, period. The only difference is the 58 has a metal ball grill that goes, screws on the closing ring, and the SM57 has a rotating plastic grill. Now, those grills are not the same in geometry, and therefore the geometry of the grills affect the high frequency response slightly. So if you hear differences between them, you're hearing the differences in how that grill affects the high frequency responses. By the way, as I mentioned before, the Unidyne 3 is also used in the 545 and the 565. So is a model 545 and an SM57 the same? They're really, really close. They're not exactly the same, but they're kissing cousins. And also, the Unidyne 3 is used inside the SM7B. Is the 57 or 58 patented? No, they're not. But the Unidyne 3 mic element was patented. So the motor was patented. Therefore, the, unit, the 58, 57, 545, 565 have a patented element. In it. There's two types of patents. One is called a utility patent, uh, and that covers how a device operates. So the Unidyne 3 motor is covered by a utility patent. There's also what's called a design patent, and that's how a product appears. So a design patent covers the housing, the utility patent covers what's inside of that. So the 545 and the SM57 have a design patent. I'm gonna show you those in the next couple of slides. Let's look at the utility patent. First, <clears throat> it is from 1966. This covers the Unidyne 3 here. The patent owner is Charles Ernest Seeler because he developed it. And here's a cutaway of the 545. And here is the simplified acoustic diagram of the Uniphase principle. Now, this is what was on the patent in 1966. And there's Ben Bauer's drawing from 1937. You can see this little simple drawing changed the entire microphone world. We still sell Unidyne 3 microphones here in 2022. Thank you, Ben Bauer. So here's the utility patent. And on the next page, we're going to see the design patent. Here's the design patent of 1961 for the 545 and the SM57. Uh, done by Bob, his name is Bob Deshaw. He was an outside designer for us. And this covered the actual look of the microphone. We never did get a design patent on the SM58 because ball grills had been used by other companies. Unidyne 3 has only one moving part, and that is the mylar plastic diaphragm and a copper, a fine copper wire, so coil attached to it. By the way, the length of the voice coil wire inside the 58 is about 40 feet. But the weight of that entire assembly is like 0.2 grams. So a US penny weighs three grams. And that's the same as 15 Unidyne 3 diaphragm and coil assemblies. So you can see they're very, very lightweight. Can a singer damage the Unidyne 3 with excessive sound pressure level? No, Cheryl's tried, she can't do it. The reason you can't damage it is that the length of the travel of the diaphragm is less than one one thousandth of an inch. It doesn't move very far. And if you did get it to go that far, it would be stopped by the magnetic pole piece and move no farther. So you can't overload a Unidyne 3 no matter what people think. You'd have to pronounce, you know, you'd have to be as loud as a NASA rocket lifting off. But it is possible that the Unidyne 3 output level could overload the mixer input. That's typically what happens. If you hear distortion from the microphone, it's because the microphone's output is clipping the mixer, and just go and you adjust the trim on the mixer, and you'll be all set. And some trivia. The original 58 handle was a two-toned. It was actually a gray with darker gray flex. We don't do that anymore. As we mentioned, it was designed for radio, television, and film studios. We didn't think it would ever make a popular rock and roll microphone. We were wrong. <clears throat> the handle originally su suddenly narrowed down to a smaller XLR connector towards the end. Uh, had 50 or 150 ohms, which is dual low impedance. The air trapped inside that handle is part of the vibration isolation mechanism. I, say, I see people take off just the, the top end of it and use it and not use the air inside of it. The microphone doesn't work the same. That air is important. Also, the 58 grill is designed to dent when you drop it. That's like a crumple zone on a body, on a car body. The idea is to take the impact. And the 58 has been used aboard the International Space Station. By the way, we had no way to know if it would work properly in weightlessness. We thought it would, and it turned out it worked just fine. 2022, we are selling these current classic models. The Unidyne 2, we're selling the 55 SH Series 2 and the Super 55. In the Unidyne 3, we sell the 545 SD, 
565, SM57, 58, SM7B, and we still sell the green bullet. What's interesting about these classic models, besides that they've been around for decades, is that sometimes they actually show up in movies. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So one of my jobs, which is the fun part of my job, or I have lots of fun parts, is to actually consult with movies about what microphones are used there. So we have up here, we have, this is the Bohemian Rhapsody movie. That was relatively easy to consult. They wanted 565 SDs for the movie. We still make them. So the movie production company bought a bunch of those. Good Morning Vietnam, Robert Williams, they, uh, Robin Williams, they used the, 50, the Series 2, the Unidyne 2, excuse me, 55S. They were still being made. They bought a bunch of them for that. This is President Kennedy. This is actually for a museum in Texas where they're trying to recreate this original podium where he announced that the U.S. would go to the moon. And of course, you can see a Unidyne microphone there. That was relatively easy to find. <clears throat> but here is Elvis Presley. So there's a movie coming out with Elvis at the end of this about Elvis. It's called Elvis, the end of this year, uh, end of this, uh, this month, excuse me. And around 2019, I got called to consult on that movie with Warner Brothers. And they sent me photo after photo after photo of Elvis at different parts of his career. And what were the microphones? And fortunately, Elvis was a fairly reliable user of Sure microphones. He was never a endorser for us. But in the 50s, he used the Unidyne 1, Unidyne 2. Um, in the uh, 60s, he used it again, kept using the Unidyne 2, but he also used our SM54. And so when that movie comes out, you will see that much of the, um, most of the microphones are sure, and we were involved in the actual historical uh, consultation and make sure that they're, what they're using are indeed accurate. So that's a fun part of my job. So let's wrap this up for questions. I think we're going to have about 10 minutes worth of questions. It's been uh, 2022, 83 years after the first Unidyne debuted, and they are still popular with everyone, engineers, podcasters, broadcasters. This, by the way, is a photo of a Roger Daltrey microphone, the ones that he sent to us, and that's how they tape it up when he performs. It was the only one he had that failed. He wanted to know why did it fail. So he sent it back to us, and we x-rayed it, and the actual fault was in the cable here, which they had bent too, too tight. So the cable failed, not the mic, and Mr. Daltrey let us keep it. So if you ever come and visit the Sure Archives, you can see the Roger Daltrey microphone. And do you remember your first Unidyne microphone? Indeed I did. I bought my first one in 1971 and I still have it. That works just fine. Let's go to the last slide, Cheryl. It's just basically about questions. If you have questions that you think of after the presentation, here's my email. It's very simple, petrm at sure.com. I'm happy to answer any questions you've got. But now let's open it up to questions and I'll take another swig of water. <laughs> and let's Let's go from there, Cheryl. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. Lots of great historical information there. Um, lots of cool things. Um, yep. While we're getting ready to launch into uh, the Q&A section, I just wanted to really quick launch another fun quiz just oh. for fun since we talked about Elvis and the Elvis movie that's okay. coming up. So I'm going to launch this poll right now. Uh, which <clears> of these sure mics was never used by Elvis? Was it the Model 55, the SM59, the 55S, the SM54? Um, so we know what the 55 is, and the 59 was the infamous um, uh, Frank mic. Sinatra mic, and the F55S <laughs> is the small version. Um, what was the Model 54? Did you talk any it, bit? It, it, yeah, SM53 and SM54 uh, were microphones. They were moving coil. They were unidirectional, but they had a low proximity effect, so that when you, when you got really close to the microphone, you didn't get a lot of buildup of the bass. Um, and that would have been useful for anyone who liked to use the microphone really close and had a lot of bass in their voice. So we made that, Cheryl, from around 1969 to around early 80s, I think. Oh, wow. Right. So it was around for a while. All right. Yeah. Yep. Um, well, you told, okay, so so did you tell us, you told us the story about your first um, your first Unidyne, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, while we're waiting for these poll questions in, um, I'll tell you the story about my first Unidyne. Um, my first Unidyne uh, was an SM58. Um, when I was a little girl, my mother was in a very fun little local gospel band in the Kansas City area. Um, and I went with her to countless gigs. We made an ever-growing duct tape ball. I remember that. Um, yeah. But she used um, an SM58. And Years later, if not a decade or two later, when I started uh, performing in bands myself, um, I needed a microphone. And I remembered she had that. And I, I reached out to her and I said, hey, mom, do you, do you still have that SM58? And she's like, oh, yeah. And 
I picked it up that last time, the next time I went home, and um, I still have that 58 to this day. And okay. of all the fun, um, I've bought limited editions, and I've gotten some really, really cool microphones. And even though it's not the one I perform with the most, it is my most treasured mic in my collection. Yeah, of course. Yeah, my of course mom's. it would be. Yeah, uh, and, and, and it's, it's still, it still works, right? Oh and, yeah, you know? still works like a charm. I think it's missing some of the foam inside of the inside of the yeah. windscreen, if not all of it. And I should probably replace that. But um, it's a great standby, um, and uh, I make sure nobody. It's really funny. You'd think they were asking to borrow one of my expensive condenser mics whenever somebody uses it. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> Be very, very careful with this one. It's very precious to me. All right, yeah, so uh, I'm gonna. Any, any, any questions? Uh, yeah, but first we're going to close this poll, and I'm going to okay. show the results. So, uh, Michael, which yeah. one was it? It looks like everybody thinks it was the 59. Well, it, was, it, it was the S59 because that was introduced after Elvis had passed. Awesome. So. And there it is. All right. Um, I've hidden the results, and now um, I think – let me just double-check my settings here. Um, I'm going to stop sharing that screen and so you can see our lovely faces uh, while we go into this questions. Uh, first thing we've got here is actually not a question, it's a comment, but um, I think you might be able to talk a little about this, Michael. Um, this person says, hi, I'm the one with the Neil Diamond Gold 545 li mic ah. that has a label for a 57 on it that you verified. I treasure that yep. mic and thanking yep. us for the discussion day. You remember that one? Yes, I do. Yep, <laughs> exactly. Um, well, you know why it had the, the 57 label on? I'm not certain, but we used the 545s because they had that the, the black closing ring, and we could engrave that like that. So uh, yes, I do remember that, and um, I'm glad you did. You know, if you ever want to have a different home, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> we can take good care of it. I promise yeah, you. Absolutely. <laughs> um, next question. This one's interesting. Has there ever been an SM57 wireless capsule? Uh, not that I'm aware of. That's a great question. No, I'm not. I'm, I have not seen a 58, 57 wireless capsule. I, so I feel like I, I might have seen, I can't remember who it was for, but I feel like I might have seen at one point, uh, there was a very, very special custom order one, our, um, that was made. Yeah. 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 I can say that there was never one in the catalog. It was generically available. The, it is possible that, uh, we did one for a certain artist, but no. Speaking of customized mics, not, sh not sure if you have an answer for this one, but can you share your most memorable experience of a performer asking for a customized mic? What was the ask and were there any challenges that you encountered because of the request? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not involved in artist relations. We need to get Corey or someone uh, talk about that. I, I, it's a great question. I, I just don't, I don't know. Sorry. No, no worries. Um, yeah, I didn't think you were necessarily directly involved no. with that. Uh, no. Next question. Just wondering, why is there an on-off switch for the SM58, but not for the SM57? Uh, you know, I, I think it's just market demand more than anything else. I mean, what I tell people is that you want an SM57 with an on-off switch, buy a 545SD. There you go. And Problem solved. Way, there, there, is, there, is, there, is, there was really, there was, we had a line of microphones in the 80s called the PE microphones, the public, that stood for professional entertainers. And there was one called maybe a PE75, sorry, I don't remember exactly what that, which was a dark gray, basically an SM57 with an on-off switch on it. And just had a different label on so that was it there's just not much of uh, demand for the uh, s57 switch but if you want one get a 545 sd great um the sm57 and the sm7 both have a unidine 3 element why does the sm7 need so much more gain um the primary reason is that you're farther away from the capsule um you know with a 58 or 57 you can get that capsule right up to your mouth if you take off the, the the foam of the SM7, you'll look up the closest you can get to that capsule is probably two inches away. And you say, two inches, that's not much. But yeah, but an eighth of an inch to two inches like that, that's probably 10 dB of gain. So if you could take, if you just, if you would take off the grill, the metal grill that protects the SM7 element and move it up close to your mouth, it would be the same output level. Um, the reason that thing is set back like that is to prevent key popping. So it is indeed the unit nine three, but it's the distance from the mouth. You just can't get close as close with an SM seven. 
Awesome. All right. Great information there. I know that's a big question that people always ask. Um, yep. Next question. Is there documentation on which Sure microphones make appearances in the movie A League of Their Own? Oh, you know, I, I, I have never seen the movie. I know. And believe it or not, I grew up in Rockford, Illinois, right, which is where it takes place. So I've not... Um, I, sh I look at that. No, I, I don't know. Is there what are they used during like the for to announcing the ball games? Yeah, maybe know? the announcements or I can't. I I have seen the movie. It's been a while. Um, but yeah. If if the if the person has asked that question, if they send me some some screen clips or photos that Petter M at sure dot com, I'll identify them. Sounds great. Yeah. Um, I know Mike's now spotting. I feel, now, now I feel guilty about not seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, though. We always talk about, you know, especially people who first join Sure, when they start to understand which the models are, you you start pointing them out in every TV show and every movie you see. Oh, that's a that's a that's a. And I think I think, Michael, I think you guys have a, a special rule in your house um, because of that. Correct. Yeah. 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 So my, uh, I've been married for this year. How many years have been married? 33 years this year. And after my first year of, it, of marriage, out to dinner with my wife and you know i, I stupidly say can I, what else can i do to make you happy <laughs> you know and she says well whenever we see a microphone on tv or in the movie or anywhere can we silently assume that's made by sure and you can tell me when it's not but you know she's gotten the bug now now she identifies it and i just go oh really honey that's really interesting <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic yeah. uh this next question i'm actually going to take um uh, I'm glad I bought the silver SM58, the anniversary model. Um, could you offer it as a color option? I love the silver color. Um, so that was a limited edition. Um, we do from time to time offer limited editions, but if we offered that color all the time, it wouldn't be limited anymore, would it? Um, mm. However, I will say there is a fantastic dealer of Shures called Colorware. Um, and Colorware does do um, custom color SM58s. They do an absolute gorgeous job. I mean, the coating yeah. is just stellar um and they they can do a custom color sm58 and you can even choose different colors for the grill the ringer at the top and then the rest of the microphone um, and they have all sorts of bright bold awesome colors um, you can customize an sm58 with them um, and right now i think an mv7 as well so those are the two sure custom items yeah items. I, i've seen the finishes the finishes are superb um, yeah. you know it's really really great I jumped all over that uh, 50th anniversary SM58 myself, though, because not only is the mic cool, but what I liked even more is the packaging. Um, we uh, recreated the the packaging oh, yeah. people recreated uh, the original look and feel of the yeah. pa the original SM58 packaging. Yeah. So. Yep, 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 yep. And I think the original manual was even included. A copy of that yeah. was included. The original user guide. All yeah. Right. Um, how does the SM58 handle water or moisture? Uh, it. It, it doesn't ignore it, but it, it's pretty hard. It, it, for example, we have in the archive microphones, uh, 58s and other microphones that were underwater after like Hurricane Sandy and uh, Hurricane Harvey or Hurricane Harvey and so forth. And, you know, they take them out, you shake them off, you let them dry off for a while. And the, the water doesn't bother them. What can mess it up is if grit gets in there. So, um, you know, the water by itself, once it dries and goes away, is not a problem. But if you get sand and grit inside there in the gap, which is where it has to move, that doesn't work. But in general, moisture and you know, dynamic microphones are, are very hard to kill. That is true. <laughs> um, next question. Many of us who used, you used to be DJs, used the proximity effect to help make yes. our voices sound richer or fuller. Is this an accidental mic characteristic or intentionally designed in? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Proximity effect actually is very, very complicated. Um, in the Sure FAQ online, there's a big technical explanation about proximity effect. It turns out that one of the downsides of Ben Bauer's uniphase network is proximity effect. And it has to do with the shape of the wavelength and the type of the spherical wavelength versus the planar wavelength and the distance between the front opening and the rear opening. Very, it's very complicated, but it is a uh, it is a outcome of the uniphase acoustical network. And it's very actually very difficult to get rid of it with a directional microphone so yeah um and you know some some people you know sinatra and other people just use it to great effect mm -hmm. yeah so, proximity effect question. can be a lot of fun um i but also we did recently within the past couple of year, years release um a model called the ksm8 um and the ksm8 is a dual uh 
dual dyne, a dual uh, diaphragm microphone. Um, and it rolls and it uses a sort of a reverse airflow to roll off proximity effect. So if you're looking for something without proximity effect, and there are benefits to that as well, um, the KSM-8 is, is a fantastic microphone. I, I will say the public controlled proximity effect, it still has some. Right? Got it, got it. Actually, an, omnidire an omnidirectional microphone has no proximity effect. But yes. omnidirectionals in general, if you're using a PA system to feed feedback, but you want a microphone without proximity effect, look at an omnidirectional. Great. Um, let's see. Somebody else said, I have four SM58s I purchased in 1974, still using them today. Put on new grills and they look brand new. So, yeah. um, I, I, I've never bought another one. <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. I, I think, I think Althea used to always say she doesn't understand why we keep selling them because they never die. So how do we keep selling more of them? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where they, I don't know where they go. So. All right. Um, there's a couple questions here. Um, asking about the, if you could explain the difference between the SM58 and a model we didn't talk about today, which is the beta 50. Yes, they're, they're, uh, um, the Beta 58 is not a Unidyne 3 element. It is a specific element by itself. Uh, it, is, it has the, it's based on, the, on a uniphase acoustical principle, but has characteristic differences. So basic differences, um, let's compare it to a 58. So Beta 58 has about 4 dB more output level because it has a stronger magnet. In it. uh, it's, called, it's called neodymium magnet. It is a super cardioid pattern rather than a cardioid pattern, so it's a tighter pattern, if you will. Uh, it actually has an undentable uh, ball on it, and since it doesn't have that crumple zone, we had to figure out another way to help that shock go away when you drop it. And it also has a, a really good uh, internal shock mount, so it's very low handling noise. Um, we had a lot of arguments about whether we are gonna call it 58. Um, you know, we were gonna try to call it something else. We didn't want people to think that it was like yet, a, you know, a better version of the 58. It's a different version of the 58. So it is not a Unidyne 3 motor. It is, has some Unidyne 3 characteristics and has those other differences that I just told you about. But plus the blue, the blue color, by the way, that was one of the things was was actually my idea. Um, we actually had mixers back then that had a blue stripe on it. And we came up with the idea of putting that blue stripe from the mixers around the ball of the Beta 58. And then we came up with a blue color for the handle that matched that. Uh, I didn't get paid extra for that, by the way, but it, it, was, it was my idea. <laughs> Love it. Um, and then somebody just asked, you know, if the Beta 58 is hypercardioid. It's not hypercardioid, it's supercardioid. So in between cardioid and hypercardioid, it's supercardioid. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> and I will, I will just reiterate, yeah, just the Beta isn't necessarily, the Beta 58 isn't necessarily better or worse. It's just different. Um, right. And, you know, as with any microphone that you choose, it's best to just use it and, and hear it on your voice. Because I personally, I think the Beta 58 is a great microphone. I'm not a fan of it on my voice. I would prefer mm -hmm. a 50, an SM58. So, yep, you know. Right. Roger Daltrey, right? Roger can afford any, any mic he wants. He uses a 58 because it works for his voice. Yeah. Exactly. Um, these next questions are a little bit sort of divergent, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. And I'm going to start with a comment. Um, whichever microphone you're using right now sounds so nice. I could listen to you talk all day. I'm assuming you mean mine. Um, that is yes. the brand new MV7, oh, brand new, maybe a couple years old uh, at this point. Um, the MV7 yeah. is actually a digital, um, version of our SM7B. Um, so it's, it's great if you want sort of that SM7B sound, um, without sort of the additional needs of having a mixer and an interface. Um, it can plug directly into your computer or mobile device. Um, but it's also really cool because the MV7 has an XLR output as well. So if you can kind of take it from there, if you want to use it with an explore, an XLR output, you want to upgrade your system over time. Um, it's just a really great versatile microphone and I'm yeah. a big fan of it. But yeah, it's cool. It's cool. But to tack on to that, somebody asked, um, doo, doo, doo. oh, hold on, here we go. Uh, could Michael, could you maybe compare sort of the motor or the 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 cartridge difference um, between the SM7B and the MV7? They're quite different. They're quite different, as a matter of fact. Um, the the they, they they still use the Uniphase principle. The Uniphase principle is pretty much universal in everybody's microphones that are that are uh, made today. Um, but the, S the MV7 actually is a much simpler design, which allows us to offer it at a, at a lower cost. It's still moving coil. It's still got a magnet in there. It's still a dynamic. Um, there are there are trade secrets in there that we have that we just don't release how, how why it is. 
Um, but I'll say it's it's like a simplified version of a, of a Unidyne three without being a Unidyne three. It really was a, a breakthrough for us. And, and I remember when, when I first heard it, and, we, and we, I just said, "And wow, that sounds great." And is it a Unidyne three? No, it's not. So I wish I could give you more, but. I'd get fired. <laughs> Doesn't it? And I'll say, as someone who's used both microphones, the MV7 is close. It's still not yeah. quite an SM7B. No. If you've got, right. if you've got the wherewithal and you want, you want best, go for the SM7B. But you know, if if it's nominal, the MV7 is a fantastic option and choice for. Yeah, it really is. I, I use it at home, and you know, and I could have the USB output going into the computer. At the same time, I take the XLR output and go into a little digital recording device, mm -hmm. and then I can. That, that later, I mean, it, it's, that, 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 I don't know who came up with the idea of the two outputs. Brilliant. It's awesome. All right. Um, next question. Um, somebody's asking, what about the SM5? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a whole thing by itself. As a matter of fact, I have a, if you're really interested, if you're really interested, go to Google and go YouTube colon Sure Pedersen SM5. And there's about a 45 minute doc, um, uh, webinar like this, comparing the SM5, how it started out and how it changed into the SM7. So, um, but the thing about the SM5, by the way, which looked like a big Nerf football, for example, people, some say, oh, that's the best voiceover microphone you ever made. We made it from around 1965 or so until 1985, so 20 years. We never sold more than 200 in a year <laughs> because most of them went to radio stations Radio stations took good care of them. They didn't buy new ones. And outside of that, they were too expensive for everyone. So the SM7 was the idea of taking the SM5 sound and putting it into a smaller, less expensive thing. But if you really want to, you know, if you really need a way to sleep tonight, YouTube colon Sure Pedersen SM5, and you'll find two or three recordings online that talk all about the SM5 and the SM7. And by the way, SM5 will never come back. <laughs> Quit asking. <laughs> Good asking. <laughs> Next question. Uh, what is the best way to clean an SM58? Well, you know, really take the, take the ball off, you know, and you can use and, and get some mild dishwashing liquid, you know, so warm soapy water, rinse it off really well, let it dry overnight. That's about the only thing you can do. There's really nothing to clean inside. There's a little bit of foam and so forth that pretty much stop it. But all you can do is clean the grill and that's it. Don't try to clean it inside you. You know, you'll do damage probably. Great. I'm going to take this next one. Since we were talking about the MV7, someone said, do you need yep. a cloud lifter for it? You do need for the SM7B. No, you do not need a cloud lifter for the MV7. It works plug and play, um, both XLR and USB. And but Michael's about to say something. <laughs> I'm going to get in my soapbox here. The reason the cloud lifter exists at all is because mixer manufacturers got cheap and they started taking out 20 db a gain if they used to be in the mic preamplifiers and the reason they did that was they could save some money and number two it made their mixers quieter if you go back and you look at mixers from the 50s and the 60s and 70s they had 70 or 80 db a gain in the preamp stages then you didn't need a cloud lifter then a company called Mackie, which was very successful came out with some small mixers that only had 40 or 50 db a gain in their mic preamps because they were designed to use with SM57s held close to your mouth and screaming. So you didn't need that. But then when you take that mixer and try to use an SM7 with it, you're shy by 20 dB a gain. So there's nothing wrong with the SM7. It's the mixer manufacturers who took out gain of the mixers. I'm done. <laughs> you know that what? Just, I had. That, 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 I just, that really annoys me. <laughs> I love it. Um, no, I had actually never heard that. Um, so yeah, I learned, true. I just learned something new today as well. Um, I thought right. I knew everything about, <laughs> about Unidyne history. <laughs> no, well, you know, uh, look, look, look at sound devices mixtures. They got tons of gain in it. You don't need to put a cloud lift through the sound design because they're sound devices because they understand that. And, so, you know, and there are yeah. some products out there right now, um, newer products uh, specifically designed for streaming and podcasting um, that do have uh, enough gain built into them. So I think we're yes. kind of seeing that, especially with the resurgence of the popularity yeah. of the SM7B. Look at it, look for at least 60 dB a gain or more in, mm -hmm. in the mic preamplifier. So, Fantastic. Yeah, and Cloud Lifter is a very clever, clever idea. You know, and they, they, they solved the problem out there. But the problem was not the SM7, the problem was the mixers not having enough gain. <laughs> you feel better? 
<laughs> Will you yes, sleep well tonight? <laughs> yeah, well, maybe. <laughs> um, do you know where... Oh, this is interesting. I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this one. Do you know where yes. the oldest Sure mic is and is still being used today? Ooh, that's a good question. You mean, you mean like out in the field? I no, guess, we, we, yeah. We, we don't have really ways of tracking that, but yeah. I mean... I'll give you I'll give you a person personal example, right? So this is like 2005 or something like that, and I, and I went back to my hometown, you know, and it was for a funeral for one of my ancient relatives, right? And I'm playing guitar at at, at the funeral parlor, and they've got a microphone up there. It's a sure microphone that's, that's still operating, and it was from and it was from 1944. Wow! And it was in perfect condition, and when the you know, the funeral was over. I came up to the funeral director and said, "How would you like a really nice, shiny, brand new Sure microphone in exchange for that?" Went, oh yeah, sure, great. So we traded off, and it was a ribbon microphone. So I mean, you know, very seriously, they just don't. In general, particularly the dynamic microphones or the or the ribbon microphones, they just don't break. You know, so it's a great question. We just don't have any way of tracking it. I can tell you this: whoever answered the question, we have Sure microphones in the archives, which date back all the way to 1932. Most of them still operate. Awesome. Um, there's still a couple of questions in the chat. I'm gonna fall, I'm gonna do two more, um, and then we're gonna call it good. But if you have a question, um, some of them aren't aren't really related to this topic. Um, but if you have some questions about um, any sort of our any of our products or any audio topics in general, um, you can always go to sure.com/contact. That's sure.com slash contact. Fill out a form there and you will open up a ticket with our support team. We have an amazing support team here at Sure um, that can answer so many different questions across so many different audio topics. Um, so if you need help selecting a microphone or just have any questions about troubleshooting something that you're running into, go to sure.com slash contact and open up a ticket with our support and, team. And search the FAQ because the FAQ has got like 24,000 items up there. And that and is, the yes. Is Right. And most of the stuff I talk about today, I actually usually put into an FAQ as well for make it searchable. Fantastic. All right. I'm just going to do uh, two more questions. The first one's for okay. me and then the last one's for you, Michael. Uh, okay. First one's for me. Is this recording going to be available? I got here late. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, as I said at the top, but you missed it because you weren't here. Um, all of our webinars are recorded um, and available for on-demand viewing. It'll take us a couple of days to get this one edited. So um, look for it sometime early next week. Um, and you can find it at sure.com slash webinars. That's my wife. My wife will be thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, sure.com slash webinars. Um, also, I will send a follow-up email to all of the registrants of this attend of this session once it's available with a direct link. So don't worry, I'll let you know. Um, you. And then just a fun last question for you, Michael. Um, what is your favorite story that you can share since becoming the Sure historian? Oh, geez, wow. Um, my favorite story is the fact is so one of my jobs at Sure was from for about 20 plus years, I was our liaison with the White House. So I worked with the White House from Bush one, Clinton, Bush two, and through Mr. Obama. Uh, and my, my favorite story really is that about four or five years ago, White House Communications Agency came to us and said, you know, Sure, you've been really supported us since 1966. And we, we know they buy our stuff. We don't give them anything, but we also give them education and we support them as much as possible. And they came to us and said, how would you like to have a presidential podium uh, for your archive? And it worked out. And so we, if you come and ever visit the Sure Archive, you will see the lectern that Ronald Reagan used in the White House press briefing room. And my favorite story was just, how do you get that podium lectern from Washington C.C. back here and re, re, you know, restore it and everything. And it was really just a cool story to have it. So yes, so if you ever come here and you visit our archives, you can take a picture of yourself behind the actual lectern that Ronald Reagan used. So I guess that's that's one of my favorite stories, but there's lots of them, but that, that's one that popped into my head. I mean, how many years do you have of stories from Sure, Michael? I, I'm on my 46th year. I was so excited to hit 10, but I got a ways to go. <laughs> yeah, I was excited to hit 10 too, but 
I tell you, you know, I, I enjoy this job so much that the years just fly by. That's the truth. All yeah. right. Thank you so much for all this great information today, Michael. This was a lot of fun. And thank you to everybody who joined us. We hope you enjoyed yourself and learned a little something. And we hope to see you on the next one. Have a great day. Bye, all. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you.